Continuing in the series on Wake Up to the Supernatural tonight, the message is demonic oppression, its detection and deliverance. Matthew chapter 12, verses 43, 44, and 45. Jesus said, When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he has come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he, and taketh with himself seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also under this wicked generation. Now, in the previous message, we discussed what the Bible has to say about demons, the evil spirits, the unclean spirits who make up a vital part of the kingdom of Satan and through whom the devil does his work and carries out his purposes in the earth. And in that, we discuss the activity of demons, and we, says that, we said that, broadly speaking, the activities of demons are twofold. Number one, they oppose God, and number two, they oppress man. And tonight, I want us to look a little bit closer and in more detail to this matter of demonic oppression. Now, first of all, let me give again a definition of what I mean by demonic oppression. Demonic oppression takes two forms. First of all, demonic influence. Now, this is not what we call possession. It is when the spirit or the demon works from the outside and exerts pressure or suggestion or temptation. And as this temptation and pressure and suggestion is yielded to, then the demonic influence increases until a what we might call a stronghold is set up in the life of the individual. Demonic influence is the oppression, the harassment, the uh, overwhelming, overbearing of an evil spirit in the life of a person that stops just short of demon possession. Now, when I use the expression demonic influence, I'm not talking about the occasional, everyday, common garden variety of temptation that we all go through. All of us are subject to and involved in demonic temptation. And when the devil tempts us, it doesn't necessarily mean that he comes to me personally, individually, every time. But he works through these demonic agencies, and their work, as we've said, is so closely identified that to say a demon has done it or to say a devil has, the devil has done it literally means the same thing. The devil is not omnipresent. He is not like God. He cannot be everywhere at once. But the Bible says he is an angel of light, and therefore we have the, uh, the right to assume he moves with the speed of light, which is pretty fast. But the devil works through these demonic a agencies, these fallen angels, evil spirits. And all of us are subjected to temptation from the devil and from his agencies every day of our lives. Now, I am not referring tonight in this message to the temptation that you and I experience daily, but I am referring by demonic influence to a stronghold in your life that the devil has set up. It stops just short of demon possession, and it bears with it a great many of the same characteristics of demon possession. And really, the more I study this, the more I come to believe that it's not too important as to whether it is invasion in or influence. It is not too important to discern whether or not it is literal possession or whether it is outside oppression because the cure, the deliverance, really is the same and many of the symptoms are the same. Demonic influence. The demon has not taken up a boat in the body. He does not dwell in the body. He works from the outside, but he overwhelms and overbears and exerts a powerful influence and slavery on mind or body. That is demonic influence. Now, demonic invasion is where the demon comes to literally 
live within the body of the individual. Now, I use the terminology demonic invasion rather than possession because demonic possession is not a scriptural term. Nowhere in the scriptures is the word or the expression demon possession found. The translators have translated the Greek word demonized this way. But the reason that it's best not to use demon possession because possession seems to indicate total ownership, absolute ownership. And uh, the devil, the demon, does not necessarily absolutely own every person in whom he indwells, as we saw this last week, and I'll not go over that. But I prefer to use the term demonic invasion or demonic inhabitation, where the demon literally comes to live within a person and treats that person's body as his house or as the city in which he lives. And he projects his own personality and his own nature and his own character through the human body and the human personality of the victim. Now, there are degrees of this. Sometimes the demon exerts influence over only one part. The Bible speaks of a spirit of dumbness or a spirit of blindness or a spirit of infirmity. And when a demon comes to indwell a person, he does not all the time exert total influence over every area of the life. It may just be over a few areas of the life. But there are degrees of demonic invasion or demonic possession all the way to the point where the personality of the individual, of the victim, is completely blacked out where he has no ability to exert or express his own nature, his own personality, the demon inhabiting him uses his body as though it were his own. And one of the significant things in the study of demons is this, this intense craving to dwell within a human body, or any physical body for that matter. For instance, in our text, Jesus says, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest, and he finds none. Now, the word rest there indicates seeking a method or a place where he can express his evil desires. That's the impact of the word rest. He seeks rest. He seeks relief, or he seeks release. He seeks a means whereby he can express his unclean and his vicious nature, and he finds none. And the indication of the scriptures is that the demon, the unclean spirit, can only find release and only find rest when he inhabits a physical body and is able to express his desires through that physical body. And so he comes back. He says, I will return to my house from whence I came out. And when he comes back, he finds it empty, and uh, he goes and picks out seven others who are more wicked than himself. And by the way, that is an indication that there are degrees of strength and degrees of wickedness within demons. They are just like human beings. They have different personalities, different traits, different intellectual levels, different moral levels, and they will express themselves and manifest themselves differently. On the occasion of the Gadarean demoniac, when Jesus told the demons, no, we don't know how many there were, but he said, my name is Legion, and Legion is a Roman number that means 6,000, indicated the 6,000 soldiers in a Roman legion, an army legion, and uh, they did not want to go back to the abyss, the bottomless pit. They wanted, they craved to indwell some physical body, and so they asked the Lord for permission to go into 2,000 swine that were feeding nearby, and so they went into those swine. Now, I don't know how many demons were actually in that man, but there were enough to run 2,000 pigs crazy and run them over a cliff. Demonic invasion is where the demon comes to literally indwell that person's body, that person's mind, and uses that body as though it were his own and projects his own nature, his own character, his own personality through that human body. Now, the question arises, how does one come under demonic oppression, whether influence or invasion? How does a person ever get to the place where he is overwhelmed and his will is overborne by a demon? Normally, with as far as I can tell, only one exception, 
Demons can enslave and oppress men only to the degree that a man violates the moral law of God. Now, I want to give four or five ways that a person can come under demonic invasion or demonic influence, how he comes under demonic oppression. And what I've just said goes for four of these five ways, that a demon can only enslave and oppress a man to the extent that that man willfully violates the moral law of God. There is one exception to that, and that is demonic oppression in a child. Now, let me say at the very outset that I do not understand this absolutely and fully, but there are instances in the Word of God where children were demon-invaded or demon-possessed. Look in Mark chapter 9 with me, the Gospel of Mark chapter 9. This is the experience that Jesus had when he and his disciples came down from the Mount of Transfiguration, and this father (coughs) has brought this demon-oppressed boy. And they brought him unto him, and when he saw him, straightway the spirit tarried him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. And he asked his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. And oft times it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. How long has this boy been like this, Jesus says? And the father replies, Of a child of a child before he was at the age of accountability, before he was responsible to God for his sin. It is possible for a child, before he reaches the age of awareness or accountability, to come under demonic oppression. Now, how this happens, I do not know fully. It is an enigma to me, and as we said last week, demonic invasion where a demon, an evil spirit, comes to literally inhabit a person's body is a miracle in the realm of evil, just as the incarnation of God was a miracle in the realm of deity. I think an indication can be found in Exodus chapter 20. In Exodus chapter 20, you have here the record of the Ten Commandments, God giving the law to his people. Now notice in verses 3 through 5 what God says. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Now, this is a strange verse and has caused a great deal of perplexity to Christians because God says, I will visit the iniquity of the fathers on the children reaching to the third generation. But I think you can solve part of that if you do not take that statement out of context. Now, it is a fundamental law of scriptural interpretation that you always interpret a verse in the light of its context. What is Jesus, what is God speaking of when he makes this promise, this warning? He is speaking of the people making graven images and worshiping other gods, worshiping other gods. And he says, when you worship other gods, I am a jealous God, and I will visit the iniquity of the fathers who worship other gods on their children to even to the third generation. All right, now, keeping that in mind, listen to what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 19 and following. What say I then, that the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. Now, Paul very clearly states in that passage that to worship an idol is really to worship a demon that behind every idol is a demon. 
that the dynamic of idolatry is demonism, evil spirits. Now, this is a revelation to many of us because we see somebody bowing down before an idol, before a graven image, worshiping some form or another, whether it's 20th century good old American form of idolatry or some other form. We worship, we see people worshiping those and we say, an idol isn't anything, it doesn't hurt them. But the Bible says that when a man sacrifices to an idol, whether he realizes it or not, he is sacrificing to what? To demons. He is sacrificing to demons. To be involved with idolatry is to be involved with demons. And so God is saying in Exodus chapter 20 that when you bow down and worship idols and you become involved in idolatry, then you pass this on to your children. And as far as I can see, the only indication in the scripture of how a child can be, before he reaches the age of accountability, before he is personally responsible, the only way he can come under demonic oppression is if his parents are involved in that demonic oppression. Now, we will not take the time tonight to read uh, experiences and quote other people, but as you study this, you'll discover that people who are involved in the occult, their parents are involved in the occult, in, uh, in uh, witchcraft, in magic, in seances, uh, fellowshipping with mediums, any, any phase of the occult or false teaching, for by the way, false teaching always has behind it the dynamic of a demon, that this demonic oppression is passed on to the children. And in so many cases, and I would almost be willing to say that in any, every case that I know anything personally about where the parents have been involved with any connection of demonism, whether it is in false teaching or in idolatry, are involved in the occult, in the many forms of expression of the occult today, this demonic oppression is passed on to the children. Now, to me, then, as far as the Word of God is concerned, that is the only instance where a person is not himself responsible for the demonic oppression. All other forms of demonic oppression you are responsible to because you violate the moral law of God. Now, let's mention a few of these other reasons. Number one, or number two, rather, false teaching brings us under the oppression of demons. I'll just give the scripture reference. 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, and 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. 1 John chapter 4, the first four verses, reveals to us that every false teaching has behind it an evil spirit, a demon. And that person, whether he be Christian or non-Christian, who exposes himself and opens his mind to false teaching, any teaching that breaks away from the traditional biblical position concerning the deity, the lordship, the only saviorhood of Jesus Christ, that person is subjecting himself to demon oppression. Now, I did not say that every person who believes a false doctrine is demon possessed, did I? I did not say that. I said that you are subjecting yourself, you are Samson laying your head in the lap of Delilah when you play around with false teaching. And I am amazed at how many Christians pray, play around with false teaching. They know it's false, but they still fool around with it. They still listen to the fellow on the radio, and then they come to me and say, Pastor, unconfuse me. Well, you shouldn't have got yourself confused in the first place. And many of you are, are subjecting yourself to demonic influence of doubt and depression and discouragement because you are playing around with false teaching. All right, another way is through relationship or association with occultism. Tarot cards, astrology, Ouija boards, fortune telling, witchcraft, anything you want to talk about, and we'll talk about that probably next Sunday night. That's a whole other area of demonic oppression. But let me say here that I have been amazed to discover how many members of the MacArthur Boulevard Baptist Church are involved in the occult without even knowing it. Now, you open your mind, you open your mind, now, I'm not talking about parlor tricks and such as this, but you open your mind to horoscopes and astrology and tarot cards and crystal balls, and you begin to get an idea that perhaps there's something to this, you are opening the door to demonic invasion and influence. And I'll just anticipate a little bit, and we'll say this, that occultism and false teaching always go together. 
and you let a person, I do not care if he is a professing Christian or not, he begins to get deeply involved with the occult. Sooner or later, unless he renounces and breaks off connection with that, he will go into false religion, into occult. Because all of it is tied up with demonic influence and demonic invasion. All right? A fourth way is by tolerating natural weaknesses. We subject ourselves to demonic influence and invasion by tolerating natural weaknesses. Now, what do I mean by natural weaknesses? Well, it's just natural for me to worry. It's just natural for me to be fearful. It's just natural for me to talk too much. It's a natural weakness. I'm so critical. It's a natural weakness. I, I have this habit of kind of, you know, exaggerating the truth. I have this natural weakness of losing my temper. I have this natural weakness of just improper and impure desires. And what happens is I, I believe Satan and his demons stand off and when you become aware of a natural weakness, he's going to say, well, now, is he going to tolerate that? Or is he going to do something about it? Is he going to bring that under the sovereign sway of the Lordship of Jesus? And when you and I begin to tolerate what we call natural weaknesses, we are opening the way for demonic oppression in our lives. And some of you tonight are under demonic influence because you have tolerated natural weaknesses in your life. You said, it's just my nature to talk too much about people. And you have found that now it is almost impossible for you to refuse to talk too much about people. We'll get to that a little bit later on. But you said it, well, I'm just a worrier. And I'll be honest with you, I am fast coming to the conclusion that the point of most demonic influence and oppression is in this matter of worry and fear. Now, the Bible says God hath not given to us the spirit of fear. Well, now, if God didn't give it to us, who gave it to us? I don't know about you, but there's only two sources of power in the world, God and, and the devil, good and evil. And God has not given to us the spirit of fear. And if you have a spirit of fear, that is demonic. And so, you see, the word fear never occurs in the Bible when Adam and Eve sinned. The first time you find anybody in the, afraid in the word of God is when Adam and Eve sinned. They weren't afraid of God before that. But God comes down in the cool of the day and he can't find Adam and Eve and he says, where were you? We heard thy voice and we were what? Afraid. You tolerate natural weaknesses. Now, let's just make this very personal tonight. I, to me, a service and a study like this is absolutely worthless it's all we, if all we do is satisfy curiosity and accumulate facts. Now, I want you tonight to identify the personal weakness that you're tolerating in your life. And if you continue to tolerate that and not take authority over that in the name of Jesus, you are, you are exposing yourself to demonic oppression. All right? Number five, persistent sin. Unconfessed sin. You see, the way a, the devil works is you give him an inch and he takes a mile. You give him a little bit of rope and he'll hang you with it. And a Christian can fall under demonic oppression by failing to deal with sin in his life. Let's just take, for instance, the sin of unforgiveness. You're rocking along there real good. Everything's going great. The Spirit of God's filling you. Jesus is Lord. Reading your Bible. Praying over here in the prayer chapel. All of a sudden, somebody says something, does something, and it offends you. You get your feelings hurt. Somebody says, have you forgiven them? I'm praying for them. <laughs> and you fail to forgive them. That is a sin in the sight of God. I don't care what they have done. I do not care what they have done. Your unforgiveness is a sin in the sight of God. Mark 11, 26. God cannot forgive you if you do not forgive others. That is a sin that you have not confessed and you have not dealt with. And what happens is the devil moves into that area 
and begins bit by bit, brick by brick, rock by rock, building a fortress, a stronghold in your life, he sets up headquarters right there in that area of your life. Every unconfessed sin, every little habit that you persist in, you are subjecting yourself to demonic oppression. All right. Now, I want us to move on to the detection of demonic oppression. How can I tell what are the symptoms of demonic oppression in my life? Now, let me just say a word of warning here. A person may have some of these symptoms and not be under demonic influence and demonic invasion. I hasten to warn you against looking at everybody and trying to size them up to discern whether or not they've got a demon. Now, let me repeat the warning that I started with five, six, seven weeks ago when we started this series. There are two dangers involved in the study of the devil and demons. One is the extreme of not knowing anything about them and being ignorant. The other is the other extreme of seeing a demon under every chair. There's probably one there, but uh, <laughs> some of us... We face the danger now of becoming demon-obsessed. And I know some people that they're demon-obsessed. Everything, any, any, everything, every time anything happens, it's a demon. It's the devil. It's a demon. And here's what happens. Man, you just, the devil moves in, and who's occupying your mind all the time? The devil, demons. Let's have the balance that the Scripture has. We need to know all that we can know about the devil and demonology, gain the information, accumulate the facts, obey the truth, but make Jesus the center of our thoughts and our attention. And you be careful if you find yourself talking more about demons than you talk about Jesus. If you find yourself gaining a morbid interest in the supernatural, the occult, the weird, more than you are about Jesus, there is a danger there. And so please do not go around looking for signs of demon oppression in everybody's life and in your own life. Let's learn all we can about it and then focus our attention on Jesus. All right, now, what are some of the symptoms of demonic oppression? Let me just say at the first that I do not believe that 1 John chapter 4 and the first four verses is a true test of demon invasion. Now, a lot of people said if you want to find out if a person is demon-possessed, you ask them, did Jesus Christ come in the flesh? And if there's a demon inhabiting that person, he'll lie and he'll say, no, Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh. You see, it says that every spirit in verse 3 that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God, and this is that spirit of Antichrist. And a great many people say that is the test of demonic invasion. You speak to that person or the spirit within that person and ask them, did Jesus Christ come in the flesh? And if they answer no, then you know they've got a demon. Well, let me say couple of things about that. In the first place, 1 John chapter 4 is not a test of demon invasion. It is a test of false teaching. Now, it is true that every spirit that says Jesus Christ is not coming in the flesh is a false spirit. But not every false spirit comes talking that way. As you read through the Gospels, you'll find that every demon that possessed a person, inhabited a person, always acknowledged who Jesus was. They never once told a lie about Jesus. And the demons are subject to us in the name of Jesus. They must submit to the authority of the name of Jesus. And on that, it seems to me that if a person in the name of Jesus commands a spirit to tell the truth about Jesus, that spirit must tell the truth about Jesus if he is under the authority of the name of Jesus. But all those demons that invaded these people in the Gospels, they acknowledged and confessed that Jesus was who he said he was. So I do not believe that is the true consistent test of demonic invasion. It is the test of false teaching. All right, now, as I said a moment ago, just like human beings, demons have different spirits, different personality traits. They have different levels of morality. That one demon went out and he found seven more spirits that were more wicked than himself, and they will manifest themselves. Now listen, you'll make a mistake if you believe that every evil spirit, every demon, always expresses himself in uncleanness, in moral depravity. 
Sometimes they express themselves in culture, sophistication, and refi refinement. He comes as an angel of light. He may even be orthodox and fundamental. They may even build hospitals and take up offerings for underprivileged children. A demon will express himself the best way he can to deceive people in gaining victory for the devil. All right. I have listed here ten symptoms of demonic oppression. We're going to go through these. I'd like sometimes just to, just to preach until I get through. I don't think I've ever preached until I got through. I usually preach until you get through. But uh, we'll be through. Number one, and I believe this is the primary characteristic of a person who is under demonic oppression. Now, remember, I'm not referring to just the occasional, everyday, common temptation. I'm talking about a stronghold in your life where he exerts and overwhelms with his influence or invasion. I believe the chief characteristic of demonic oppression is a violated will. A violated will. Or you can put it another way, compulsion. Listen to Luke chapter 8. Here again is the man, the Gadarean demoniac. Verse 29, For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for oftentimes it had caught him, and he was kept bound with chains and in fetters, and he brake the bands and was driven, was compelled of the devil, of that demon, into the wilderness. He was compelled. He was driven. A demon drives, he compels. All right, listen again in Mark chapter 9. And he asked his father, How long is it since this came unto him? And he said of a child. And oft times it hath cast him into the fire. There it's violating his will. And into the waters to destroy him. A violated will. Let's put it another way. Involuntary response. The human will is overwhelmed and overborne by an irresistible power. It is persistent and repeated. Oft times this happens. From a child, it's a stronghold. It seems to me that what happens is the demon takes the normal and stretches it out of proportion. This, to me, is the chief characteristic of demonic oppression. A violated will, an overwhelming and irresistible power overbearing my own will. Now, I'll be very honest with you. I believe that a great many people who just cannot kick the habit of smoking are under demonic oppression. They want to, they try to, but they can't. Their will is violated. There is an involuntary response. There is a compulsion. And I have known people who, when they who when they dealt with it on, on these grounds of a demonic oppression, they were delivered from it. I believe an alcoholic is under demonic oppression against his will. His will overborne, overwhelmed by an irresistible will. And I've known men who were alcoholics, who took the cures, who went to psychiatrists, who did everything, that, who went to AAs, who did everything. But when they recognized it as demonic oppression, and then when they took deliverance from demonic oppression, they were delivered from their alcoholism. People who are hooked on drugs, drug addicts, I believe that most of it is demonic oppression. I've known people who have, who have absolutely been delivered from a drug habit without any, without any pain to withdraw. Now, any way you want to cut it, friend, that is a miracle. Some people are driven by lust, by impure thoughts, by blasphemy, by cursing, and just an irresistible, you don't mean to it, but just irresistible, a compulsion to curse, a compulsion... Uh, to lust, a compulsion, to read filthy books. I believe that the people who frequent these art movies and X-rated uh, houses are driven by demons, com uh, a compulsion to feed that perversion. And it may not be anything as gross as that. It may be this matter of your lying or gossip or criticism or talking too much, eating too much, a compulsion. I, I believe that, a compulsion. 
where my will is overborne and overwhelmed by an irresistible power. Now, again, I'm not talking about your occasional acts of sin, your occasional failings, your occasional slips. I'm talking about this, that if there is an area of your life, if there's one thing or two things that you have absolutely no control over, you've confessed it, you've prayed about it, you've repented of it a thousand times, but it is an area of repeated, repeated, constant, continual defeat, your will is overwhelmed at that point, I believe you have the right to assume that you are under demonic oppression of one sort or another. And the wrong diagnosis, of course, means the wrong treatment. You've got to diagnose rightly. You say, well, preacher, how do I know if this is demonic oppression or not? Well, let me tell you the way I feel about that. I believe you just ought to shoot down every hole, and if the devil's there, you'll get him. <laughs> now, I'm serious about that. I mean, what have you got to lose? If he's not there, all of you lost is a little powder and buckshot. <laughs> Just shoot down every hole. If he's there, you'll get him. But I say to you tonight that one of the chief, and to me, the chief characteristic of demonic oppression is violated will. Compulsion. Driven. A compelling drive to do something and you have absolutely no say-so about it. Now, you did it one time. But now you don't. All right. Another one is personality change. Personality change. All of this is illustrated in, the, in Mark chapter 5, Mark chapter 9, Luke chapter 8. Personality change. And this may take the form of a number of directions. But listen, all of a sudden a person becomes depressed or he becomes oppressed or there's a personality change. There is the projection of a new personality into that person. A third one is a morality change. A morality change. A complete change of the moral character and spiritual disposition of a person. Now, I have a lot of people that come to me who are not members of my church, of this church, because the problem they have, they do not want to share with their own pastor because then this would they feel it would create a tension between their pastor and themselves and they would be embarrassed to go back to that pastor. And so many times they come to me with family problems. And more and more of this is happening. People outside of our church coming to me with marital problems. And you know what I hear over and over and over again? Pastor, I cannot understand it. My husband just seemed to change all of a sudden. He has been a faithful husband for 15 years. And within the space of a few weeks, he has deserted me. He is involved with another woman. I cannot talk to him. He is a different person. I'm talking about preachers, denominational workers, deacons, missionaries, evangelists, as well as Mr. and Mrs. Christian. A sudden and drastic morality change. A complete change of moral character and spiritual disposition. Suddenly and what? Surprisingly. How many times I've heard people say you would never have thought it of brother so-and-so. That is so out of character for Mrs. So-and-so. That is one of the symptoms of demonic influence, demonic invasion. And of course, that Gadarean demon, uh, demoniac in Mark chapter 5, he came what? He wore no clothes. He had no clothes. And one of the symptoms of a demonic oppressed age is, is nudity. All right, let's move on to another one. A spirit of isolation or independence. Mark 5, that man dwelt in the tombs withdrawing from society, the spirit of let me alone, let me alone. Another one is self-hatred, self-loathing, self-hatred. These people, when they were oppressed by a demon, they cut themselves, they hurt themselves. Self-hatred. Man, what a characteristic that is relevant today. 
relevant today. You talk to the average psychiatrist and he'll tell you that one of the most common mental and emotional afflictions of modern America is self-hatred, self-disgust. Another one is self-destruction. Mark chapter 9, verse 22. This demon sought to destroy this boy, throwing him into the fire, throwing him into the water. Now, let's stop here for a moment and examine a phenomenon. Self-destruction is a symptom, a characteristic of demonic oppression. Now, I submit to you that it is a phenomenon of human nature that a man or a woman will be going on a course that they know is going to end in disaster. They know that the consequences of that course of action, that habit of life, is disastrous, and yet they'll go ahead and do it. Have you ever seen that happen? Of course you have. I cannot understand. It is an enigma to every psychiatrist because there's, he's not able to find a cause. Why it is that a person will know that to continue in this course is going to reap awful consequences. If he takes another drink, it's going to kill him. If he doesn't stop smoking, he's going to die. If he doesn't stop this, he's going to destroy his business, his life, his mind, his home. And still knowing all of this, he is con he is insistent on being driven to the brink of destruction. And any time a demon has the influence and the power and the authority over a man, sooner or later he is going to bring him to the brink of destruction and do everything he can to push him over. Now, many of the demons that invade a person do not always manifest themselves. There are some demons that lurk inside of a man just waiting until that man is oppressed to the point where this demon can take over. The scriptures bear this out. When Jesus would cast out many of these demons, many of these demons had not, had not manifested themselves. That's why Jesus would ask what their name was. He said, my name is Legion, for we, we are many. And I am convinced that in a great many people there is indwelling them, inhabiting them because of some tolerance of sin in their life, because of some occult association in life, there is a demon who is intent on destroying themselves. And when that man is oppressed and weakened, his will is weakened to the point where he will take his own life, then this demon will take over. And I believe that. I believe that every suicide that is not traced to an organic injury of the brain, every suicide is a result of demonic oppression. Every desire to take your own life is demonic temptation. And I guarantee you that 99% of the people here sometime in your life have had a desire to take your own life. When you were a child or growing up or a teenager. That is demonic temptation. But what happens is that through our association with sin, unconfessed sin, the occult, some other means, this demon of self-destruction moves in. And when your will is violated to the extent and your will and personality is sublimated to the extent that he can take over, then he will. Self-destruction. All right, another one is violence, Mark chapter 5 and verse 9. Another one is supernatural strength. People who are invaded and possessed by demons have supernatural strength. Number nine, supernatural knowledge. Number ten, and I think this is perhaps one of the most important, opposition to Jesus Christ and spiritual things. Perhaps the common characteristic of all demonic oppression is opposition not to religion, opposition not to God, opposition to Jesus Christ. Opposition to Jesus Christ. When this demon-possessed boy was faced with Jesus, the Bible says when he saw him, that evil spirit threw him down and foamed at the mouth and tore him just at the very presence of Jesus. And that man in Mark chapter 5, when he came down and fell at the feet of Jesus and said, Jesus, why? what are you doing here? Have you come to torment us before our time? He wasn't really worshiping him like we worship Jesus tonight. He fell down in an attitude of worship to beg Jesus to leave him alone to get out. Opposition to Jesus Christ. All right. Now, let's very quickly and very hurriedly come to the last point, deliverance from demonic oppression.
How does a person gain deliverance from demonic oppression? I want to put it in two forms. First of all, gaining initial deliverance, and then secondly, losing that deliverance. Gaining initial deliverance. And in order to keep it brief and finish before much longer, we'll just say a word about them. Number one, if you believe that you are under demonic oppression, whether it's influence or invasion. And by the way, somebody asked me, can a person cast a demon out of himself? I believe he can. If he can't, then he needs to find someone who can help him and pray for it. It all depends upon the degree of that demonic invasion and inhabitation. But if you believe that there's some area of your life where you are under demonic influence or demonic invasion and you want to be delivered from it, and I believe that this is what you must do. Of course, number one, you have to be a Christian. But if I were under demonic influence tonight, I would first of all get on my knees in prayer and identify myself with Jesus in prayer. Identify myself as a member of God's family, as being in vital union with Jesus, as being under the protection of His shed blood. I would identify in prayer, open a loud prayer, my union with Jesus Christ. Number two, I would identify that stronghold, that oppression. I would identify it. I would name it. If it's gossip, if it's lust, if it's nicotine, if it's this, if it's that, I would identify that and name it. Number three, I would confess that sin that led to it. If I knew what it was, or I would renounce my connection with it. And by the way, let me just say a word here. You must, if you are involved in the occult, if you're going to be delivered, you must renounce all ALL -L connection with that. Number four, you must submit yourself to God. James 4, 7, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now that is a divine arrangement. And I know some people who have tried to resist the devil and it hasn't worked because, first of all, they have not submitted themselves to God. Now, there are two reasons why you must submit yourself to God first. Number one, if you're not submissive to God, then there's a war going on between you and God. And you're not only fighting the devil, you're fighting God. And it's pretty hard to win a battle when you're fighting it on two fronts. And first of all, you must settle the war between you and God. And if you are not totally submitted to the Lordship of Jesus, then you are at war, you are rebelling, you are committing high treason against heaven's king. You are a prodigal son. But not only that, when you submit yourself to God, then you have access to all the power of God. And I've referred to that in a previous message, and I won't back over that. But when I submit myself to God, that brings all the power of God at my disposal. So first of all, you must submit yourself to God. Are you willing tonight to bring every, every, every area of your life under the sovereignty of His Lordship? Are you? If you are not, then you'll not be delivered. If there is any area of your life that is not submitted to the Lordship of Jesus, then you cannot be delivered because every area that is not submitted to him is an open invitation, a guilt-edge invitation to, 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 to Satan's work in your life. All right, number five, have you lost your place? Number one, identify yourself with Christ in prayer. This is what I would do. I'm just telling you what I would do. I identify myself with Christ in prayer. Number two, I would identify the, the oppression, the pawn of Satan's stronghold. Number three, I would confess the sin that led to it, renounce any connection with it. Number four, submit myself to God. Then number five, I am ready to resist the devil. Now, probably the first time that you ever talk to the devil, you're going to feel a little ridiculous. You say, where do you get the scriptural grounds for talking to demons and evil spirits and devil? The Bible. Jesus spoke to the devil. He said, get thee behind me, Satan. Uh, the apostle Paul spoke to the spirit within the woman. In Acts chapter 16, the woman at Philippi had the spirit of fortune telling. He spoke to the spirit within her. Didn't talk to that girl. He didn't try to show her the errors of fortune telling. He didn't try to rehabilitate her. He didn't try to do social work with her, get her a better job. 
he spoke to the spirit that was within her and said, In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, I command you to come out of her. When you have submitted yourself to God, you rebuke the devil. You resist him. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Do you believe that? That's in the word of God. If you don't believe it, he won't flee from you. Because your act of unbelief neutralizes everything you do. Resist the devil. And I don't know any way, better way to do it than do it the way the Apostle Paul did. In the name of Jesus, I resist you, I rebuke you, I command you to depart. If, you, if there's a stronghold in your life, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5 is a scripture reference you'll want to look up later. If there is a stronghold in your life, if you are oppressed by demonic influence, after you've identified that and done all that, you ought to say in the name of Jesus, I command this demonic stronghold of, and name it, cast down in the name of Jesus. And Satan, I rebuke you and resist you in the name of Jesus. Now, boy, the amazing thing about Jesus is that he just had to speak a word, and those demons came out. And the Bible says... In Mark chapter 16, I, I like the way Weymouth translates it, making use of my name, they will cast out demons. Making use of my name, they will cast out demons. Now listen, let me just say a word here. Don't go fooling around with this. Don't go looking for demons, and don't go looking for demon-oppressed people and demon-possessed people. Don't go looking for that. And I've heard a lot of people, they deal with somebody that's demon-possessed, demon-invaded, and they'll start talking to them, asking all sorts of questions. Listen, Jesus never did that. The Apostle Paul didn't, did, didn't do that. You can get to the place where you will start consulting evil spirits, and then you'll be right in the middle of it yourself. Jesus didn't fool around with them. He wouldn't let them talk. He asked them a couple of times, what's your name? And that's all. And he said, you come out. You get out. And in the power of the name of Jesus, he just commanded that that demon to depart and he always did number six then believe that it is settled believe that it is done first john 5 4 this is the victory that overcometh the world even our faith let me go through those once again if tonight i had a demon oppression in my life an area of my life that was under demonic influence or invasion i would first of all in public in prayer Praying out loud where the devil could hear me, by the way, Jesus never rebuked the devil silently. You know why? Because the devil can't read your thoughts. And I've talked with people who have silently tried to cast demons out of people and then just nothing would happen until they spoke to them. They cannot read your thoughts. Jesus never thought a demon out of anybody. He never thought the devil away from him. He always spoke to him. He always spoke to him. So in prayer, first of all, I would identify myself with Jesus. I just praise the Lord for a while. Claim that precious blood of Christ, cleansing me from all sin. Secondly, identify the oppression, identify the stronghold. Number three, confess the sin that led to it. If you can remember it, if you can't, just renounce all connection with it. Number four, submit yourself to the authority of God, to the Lordship of Christ. Number five, then speak to the devil out loud in prayer. Rebuke him. This is not a prayer. This is a command. Mark chapter 17, these disciples tried to cast this demon out of this boy, and they said, why couldn't we do it? Jesus said, if you've got faith, you can say to this mountain, be thou removed into the sea. And I've said before that that is not a text for prayer. Because when I pray, I don't pray to a mountain. I pray to God. That's not, he's not talking about prayer. He's talking to the mountain. That's not a prayer. That's a command. It is the command of faith. He said to this mountain, Be thou removed into the sea, and it will be. Now, what was the mountain in that particular case? It was that demon in that boy. And Jesus said, Fellows, if you just had faith, you could have said to that mountain that was standing in your way, that demon in that boy, Get out of there, and he would have done it. But you just didn't believe. So you command the devil to depart. You command that stronghold cast down. You command that, that demon cast out. And then number six, praise God and thank him that it's done. Just thank him that it's done. Thank him that it's done. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Not by feelings, but just by faith in the word of God. Now let me just say a word in closing. 
about the possibility of losing your deliverance. And you can lose it. You can lose your deliverance. This demon that was cast out of this man in Mark, Matthew chapter 12, what did he do? He came back and he found it what? Empty. And the last case was worse than the first. Now, I've dealt with people and they have been delivered and then they've lost it for one or two or more reasons. Now, let me give you just several reasons how you can lose that deliverance. And if you'll just turn these away around, this is the way to keep that deliverance. Number one, you lose your deliverance when you fail to confess your sin. Failure to confess sin. Failure to keep your sins confessed up to, the, up to date. I think you ought to know that once a demon is cast out of a person, he always thinks of it as his house. You notice? He came back and he said, I will return to what? My house. That's his house. That's what he always thinks of it as. And he'll always come back. Even when Jesus defeated the devil, the Bible says that the devil departed from him only for a what? A season. He always came back. There is no immunity to temptation. The demon will come back and he'll want to get back in. He'll want to get back in. And if you have unconfessing in your life, what you're doing is you're opening the door so he can get back in. Failure to repent. Now that's different than confessing sin. Failure to repent. Repentance is an act of the will where I refuse to have any more to do with this thing. I'm going to stop playing around with this sin and any sin and I change my mind and I turn away from it. And there's some people who are constantly confessing sins but never repenting of them. You must repent of it and if you fail to repent of that sin, you're opening yourself for the demon coming back and and uh, repossessing your life. Number three, failure to forgive others. Failure to forgive others. Number four, failure to break completely with the occult. Acts chapter 19, verses 18 and 19, when these people got right with God, they went out and they burned $50,000 worth of books and artifacts and charms and such as that. That's quite a bonfire. You got anything in your home like that, you ought to get rid of it. Failure to break completely with, with the occult opens the door to repossession. Number five, failure to submit to the Lordship of Christ. When he came back, he found the house, what? Swept, cleaned up, garnished. That means it was furnished, but what? Empty. That's a participle, which means it was standing empty. You know what that indicates? Passivity. He was passive. Now, friends, passivity in the Christian life is one of the most dangerous things. Being passive. What do you mean by that? I mean getting all your sins confessed up, rededicating your life, emptying the house, and leaving it empty. Not filling that life with the Lordship of Jesus. When he came back, he found it empty. And listen, an empty house never stays empty. As a matter of fact, I've never been in an empty house. Of course, when I got in there, it wasn't empty, but that's not what I meant. I've never been in an empty house. You go into a house, we say it's empty. No, it isn't. There's a spider over there in the corner. There's dust. No house ever stays empty. You've got to fill it with something. If you don't fill it with Jesus, the Lordship of Jesus, then you're going to lose your deliverance. Number six, failure to live by faith. Faith in the Word of God. The Word of God says, I have victory. I believe it. When I begin living by my feelings, when I become a slave to my emotions and my feelings, then I'm opening the door for the deception, the disillusionment of the, of the, of the devil. Let me read through those six one more time before we close because they're so important. Failure to confess sin. Failure to keep your sin confessed up to date. Failure to repent, to turn against it, turn away from it. Failure to forgive others. Failure to break completely with the occult or whatever connection you've had with this. Failure to submit to the Lordship of Jesus and failure to live by faith. Just taking God at His Word. Not, not depending upon how you feel or circumstances for victory, but you believe it because God's Word says it so. Thank you for listening to this message by Ron Dunn. 
Ron Dunn's messages are for personal edification, not to be duplicated, uploaded to the web, or resold without prior written permission. The Ron Dunn Audio Library is managed by Sherwood Baptist Church. For more Ron Dunn materials, including sermon outlines, devotions, scanned pages from a study Bible, books, CDs, MP3s, and DVDs, visit rondunn.com or the Sherwood Baptist Bookstore, The Source. Sermons are also available on the Ron Dunn Podcast.